It's traditional to begin and end each session of meditation with thoughts of goodwill for all beings without exception. And the purpose in each case is different. In the beginning, you start the meditation with thoughts of goodwill as a way of getting the mind in the right frame, in the right context to meditate. You want to pull yourself out of your own little personal narrative, the events of the day, and take a larger view before you settle down and look at the present moment. If you don't, it's very likely that you'll take your narrative into the present moment with you. And if it's an unpleasant narrative, it makes the present moment unpleasant as well. If it's been a bad day, sit down and try to get the mind into the present moment. Stay with the breath, and you find it doesn't stay with the breath. And if you've been down on yourself in the course of the day, you get down on yourself even more. You're a miserable meditator. You can't do it. See? You keep wandering off the breath more proof that you're miserable. So a good way to break that connection is to start thinking a few thoughts of infinity, all beings everywhere, like that character in Through the Looking Glass who says he likes to think of two or three impossible things every morning before breakfast. It's good to think about infinity a couple times a day. It changes your perspective. And you're actually following the pattern of the Buddha, the night of his awakening. Those three knowledges that he gained prior to full awakening follow this pattern as well. The first knowledge was recollection of his past lives, all his narratives, going back many aeons. Notice he didn't go f from that knowledge straight to the present moment. Second knowledge had to do with all living beings. He had seen in his first knowledge that he had gone through many lifetimes in many different roles, many different levels of being. But that knowledge left a couple of questions unanswered. Was he the only one who had those many levels of being? And why were there so many? Why were they so varied? So in the second watch of the night, he inclined his mind to the knowledge of the passing away and re-arising of beings. And he saw that everybody goes through this process of death and rebirth. And everybody changes roles, changes levels. in what at first looks like a very erratic way, up and down. Later he said it was like throwing a stick up in the air. Sometimes it lands on this end, sometimes it lands on that end, sometimes it lands splat in the middle. It doesn't seem to have much rhyme or reason. But as he saw things in the larger context, he began to see there was a pattern. People took rebirth in line with their karma in line with their actions, and their actions were based on their views. People who acted on wrong views, had no respect for the noble ones, tend to go to bad destinations. People who had acted on right views with respect for the noble ones went to good destinations. So there was a pattern. The pattern was determined by view and intention. And after seeing the larger pattern, that's when he was ready to focus on the present moment. How do view and intention operate in the present moment? And is there some way that this knowledge can be used to put an end to suffering? In that third watch of the night, that's what he found. Looking at intentions as skillful and unskillful, looking at views as right and wrong, applied to the question of suffering. He discovered the Four Noble Truths. He applied them, 
follow the tasks appropriate to them and gain awakening. So notice the pattern. Starts with his own narratives, then moves to the larger picture, and then focuses in on the present moment. This is what we have to do as we settle down to meditate. You remind yourself that you're here for the sake of goodwill, for the sake of true happiness. And you realize you're not the only one out there who has to train his or her mind. Everybody has to train the mind. And it's not an easy process for anybody. Some people may find it easier than others. That's because they did the work in the past. So taking this larger view reminds you of your intention for being here and also reminds you that when things aren't going well in the meditation, you're not the only one for whom they're not going well. I've been counseling some people in a Dharma study program, and their experience with retreats up to this point had been you go in and you don't talk to anybody, and you go home. So you're just sitting there in the retreat hall, meditating. Everybody else looks so calm and still, and you're fighting with your hindrances, with your defilements. You seem like you. You seem like you're the only person who's suffering that way. But when these people come in this study retreat, they get a chance to talk with the other people, and they discover everybody goes through the same thing. Everybody has the same problems. And instead of being discouraging, it's actually encouraging. You realize that even though things may take a lot longer than you'd hoped, the fact that they take long doesn't mean that it's hopeless. It's the common pattern throughout the world. When you see the larger pattern and understand it, then you're in a much better position to focus on the present moment with the right attitude, with the right sense of balance. So spreading thoughts of unlimited goodwill help in this direction. as a way of preparing you to settle down with the breath. And then while you're with the breath, it's actually a very good way of showing goodwill for yourself right now. And there's enough suffering in life. You don't have to compound it by breathing in a way that's harsh and uncomfortable or unhealthy. So you can start looking at the breath and seeing how it's affecting the body in different parts, where the breath energy seems comfortable, where it seems strained, what you can do to make it comfortable throughout, all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out, and all the way through all the different parts of the body. You start seeing where, which part of the breath cycle you push too much. Are you squeezing out breath energy too much as you breathe out? Are you making the breath too long as you breathe in? Notice how you relate to the different parts of the cycle. Also notice how you relate to the different parts of the body as you're breathing in, the different levels of breath energy in the body. because the breath then enters the body at different rates. There's the breath coming in and out of the lungs. It takes a while for that to fill the lungs. But there's also the energy that flows in the nerves, and that goes a lot faster. In fact, as soon as you've started to breathe in, before you even notice it, the breath has already gone through all your nerves, unless there's a blockage someplace. Some people say, as they breathe in and try to get the breath to go to the different parts of the body, they can't get it all the way down to the body by the, say, all the way down to the legs by the time the lungs are full. That's because they're trying to force a harsh breath or a heavy breath down the legs, and that's not actually good for the legs. 
think of the breath and the, the nerves and the blood vessels as a lot subtler, a lot lighter and a lot faster. And see how that works. There's a lot of experimenting that has to go on, because each of us relates to the breath in different ways, relates to the energy in the body in different ways. And so each of us has different habits we have to learn how to correct. This is one of the reasons in the forest tradition the Ajans are so sometimes seemingly harsh with their students, because the students are not observant about the little things going on in daily life. And the reason for this is they want to make the point that you have to be very, very observant. If you can't observe the little things in daily life, you're not going to be able to observe the littler things in the course of your meditation. So that's what we're doing here in the present moment, exploring how the breath in the body feels right here, this world of the body right here, without reference to the world outside, just this world of energy. The more you can get into it, the more you can get yourself immersed in it, the more you begin to notice the subtleties of the energy, the better. The body feels better, the mind gets more and more concentrated, feels less and less frazzled. Let's put you in a good position at the end of the meditation to spread thoughts of goodwill again. This serves two purposes. One, it reminds you when you leave the meditation how you want to relate to other people. You want to relate in a way that is conducive both to your happiness and to theirs. And the force of a concentrated mind can actually make that wish for goodwill more effective. I know many stories of people who've sensed when somebody's been meditating and has spread thoughts of goodwill, and they, to them specifically, and they realize it, they sense it. The power of a concentrated mind gives a lot more energy to the thoughts that you focus on as you're leaving meditation. So you want them to be thoughts of goodwill. They're good for you, they're good for the world. So try to make this a regular part of your meditation. At the beginning, lots of goodwill for everyone, everywhere. And as you leave the meditation, again, thoughts of goodwill for everyone, everywhere. It creates the right framework, the right context for the meditation. It keeps you on track. And you find that Good breathing helps with goodwill, and goodwill helps with good breathing. This is a common pattern throughout the Buddhist teachings. It is possible to find a happiness that's good for you and good for others. The kind of happiness where everybody benefits. Internally, this means both body and mind. Externally, means both you and everybody around you. That's the kind of happiness we're working toward. 